second of four webinars that are part of the CORE 7B Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative Synthesis and Legacy Efforts. This session is two moderators. I'm Cam Ainsworth, Associate Professor of Fisheries Oceanography at the University of South Florida. And joining me is Libby, Libby Featherston Resch, Program Director at the Florida Institute of Oceanography. I'll be introducing our speakers today, and Libby will be moderating the questions. Questions can be entered any time during the webinar in the chat box located to the bottom or right of your screen. Libby will consolidate a subset of the questions uh, for the speakers to answer at the end of the three presentations. As part of the Core 7B synthesis efforts, we seek to develop a conceptual modeling framework that will align new knowledge gained since the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. This framework will help address questions posed by stakeholders in the event of a future spill. Sea Grant recently compiled a list of potential questions from stakeholders that our conceptual model must be able to answer. Monica Wilson of Sea Grant will briefly explain the origin of these questions. Monica? Thanks, Cam. Um, so as Cam said, my name is Monica Wilson. Uh, I am the Florida Sea Grant representative of the Sea Grant Oil Spill Outreach Team. The team aims to increase the use of oil spill science by people whose livelihoods depend on the healthy Gulf of Mexico. Our team continuously engages with people in small and large group settings to learn about their oil spill science related questions and concerns. The questions shared here represent our target audience input between 2014 and 2018. Our team solicits this input in multiple ways, either by one-on-one -on -one or small group meetings with target audience members, input sessions with large groups of target audience members, and through evaluations completed before and after oil spill science seminars and workshops. These questions were pulled specifically for this core area synthesis and do not represent the entirety of the data that Sea Grant has collected for the program. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Sea Grant identified 48 questions relating to ecosystem impacts. These touched on food webs, benthic, pelagic, and infaunal organisms, mammals and juvenile fish, as well as inshore and deep sea habitats, sublethal effects and dispersants, fisheries, and stock assessment. Some pressing questions may help direct future research. For example, one commenter asked how we can reconcile the trade off between short-term negative effects of remediation actions like dispersant use with the long-term benefit to restoration. Our initial starting point for developing an integrated conceptual model is given in the uh, following four box figure, where we've identified four domains of knowledge, physics, ecosystems, socioeconomics, and human health. Answering the broad questions posed by stakeholders in future spills requires that we address the details of the linkages between each of these domains. Today we have three speakers, Dr. Steve Murawski from the University of South Florida and Principal Investigator of the Sea Image Consortium, Dr. Tracy Sutton of Nova Southeastern University and Principal Investigator of the Deep End Consortium, and Dr. Jim Rizika from Oregon State University who is a co-investigator on a Gulf of Mexico trophic modeling project with LENFEST. As you'll see, our speakers will address a common theme of ecosystem connectivity. It's a feature of the Gulf of Mexico ecosystem that has emerged often in Gomri studies of ecosystem injury and recovery. This slide shows a visual example of connectivity from the Atlantis ecosystem model from the Sea Image project. Atlantis is a spatial model, and you'll see here the loss of biomass in the grouper guild 10 months after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Part of this can be attributed to direct toxicological impacts, but Atlantis suggests that collateral damage from starvation and reduced larval supply were equally as harmful to the grouper guild and acted over a much larger region than just the oil footprint. Following this webinar, there will be a virtual working session scheduled for Thursday, May 16th from 10 a.m. to 12 noon Eastern Time. During the session, we have invited guests discussing the conceptual model framework. If you're interested in listening in, please type your email address into the chat box. So we'll begin with our first speaker, Dr. Steve Murawski. His talk is entitled Horizontal and Vertical Connectivity affect the resiliency and vulnerability of Gulf of Mexico fish populations to deep sea blowouts. 
Steve, go ahead. Thank you, Cam. Um, just in the process of sharing my screen at this point. Uh, okay, can you can everybody see that my screen? Yeah, looks good. Okay, very good. good. So, as Cam said, one of the uh, recurring issues that comes up in in terms of understanding oil spill impacts, particularly at the scales of of Deepwater Horizon are the issues of the resiliency of the uh, underlying species and communities and their vulnerability to to the oil spills. And so uh, my colleagues uh, Claire Paris and Tracy Sutton and of course Cam have put together this, um, this uh, slide deck to basically look at issues related to um, the, uh, the field data that we've collected over the run of Gomri, um, an analysis of some of the uh, trends in those data, and also uh, several modeling approaches to understanding the notions of connectivity and uh, as they relate to resilience and vulnerability. And this, um, this slide deck will set up um, Tracy Sutton's talk uh, following this in terms of um, the horizontal, uh, uh, the, sorry, the vertical connectivity issues. So in terms of understanding res resilience and vulnerability, um, one of the important uh, aspects of, uh, of um, the, the issue is understanding ecosystem architecture. And that, by that, I mean um, in a large marine ecosystem like the Gulf of Mexico, um, how is it that um, you have um, a series of structures that might be quite modular, and that is um, self-contained versus a, a larger integrated um, uh, uh, format for this ecosystem architecture. And in, in terms of the resiliency of any network and including ecosystem networks, uh, a modular um, uh, type network where um, there you have small entities that are um, more or less independent of each other. The, the pros uh, in terms of um, looking at overall uh, vulnerability and resilience is that um, a very modular structure is isolated from the cascading network failures. And that is, and we've seen this in, in other uh, parts of, of human endeavor, that uh, small uh, perturbations in one area, you know, might actually cascade to larger things. And you can think about World War Two, uh, World War One, being uh, isolated um, issues um, cascading. Um, also, in modular structures, um, they tend to uh, be uh, sources of evolution biodiversity, uh, which tend to um, uh, be somewhat self-contained. Of course, the the downsides of a, a completely modular system are that there is a little network redundancy and so you have potentially long recovery times um, if uh, uh, one of the modular modules is particularly um, uh, impacted. On the other side of the coin you've got a highly integrated system that um, there is a high degree of redundancy and recovery potential but um, that local perturbations may actually uh, uh, perpetrate throughout the ecosystem and uh, in particular um, highly integrated systems may be particularly vulnerable to invasion of alien species. Um, there's quite a bit of information and new studies that have been ongoing looking at this notion of network modularity. There's a um, one reference that was recently published in Science um, and when you think about um, beyond ecosystems there's lots of um, parallel um, evolution in terms of these concepts uh, for example world financial networks and power grids, et cetera. So, so this is not a concept that's, that's uh, only germane to the ecosystem. So, so the issue is where on this uh, continuum of modularity versus integrated systems um, is the sweet spot uh, as far as um, uh, ecosystems being um, resilient to perturbations like large scale oil spills. And so um, in terms of the connectivity architecture, there are really kind of uh, four areas that we've looked at in terms of indicators of connectivity. First is um, in looking at the large marine ecosystem of the Gulf, we looked at a shared species distributions, and that is uh, as, a, as a potential indicator of, of how uh, modular or uh, integrated the system might be. Um, we can also look at movement patterns of adult fishes, and that is for a large system like the Gulf, um, to what extent do adult fishes um, work around the system and and therefore you know integrate you know these the various habitats? Uh, certainly, an important aspect of this is the dispersal of uh, fish eggs and larvae, uh, and that becomes a mechanism uh, for um, uh, interrelationships of the uh, 
of, of the various modules that you might have. And then, of course, um, genomic studies can actually be used to verify the degree of connectivity you might have. So um, we've looked at uh, at least the first um, three of these as it, as it relates to the Gulf of Mexico system to try to characterize uh, uh, the system in terms of the patterns of modularity versus integration. So uh, one of the data sets that we've used is the series of um, continental shelf longline surveys that have been conducted and supported not only by Gomri but also NOAA since 2011. And we've basically worked on all the continental shelves. So these are um, primarily data related to the demersal fish communities in the relatively shallow waters down to around, around 300 meters uh, or so. And so the, so the question from these data sets is uh, how modular are the multi-species fish communities or are how, uh, conversely how integrated they might be. So these are just basically the catch rates from, from the, uh, the long line sets that have been done in the Gulf. And so um, uh, one of the things that we did to try to assess the degree of modularity is to look at uh, simultaneous cluster analysis, which uh, groups all of the stations I just showed you and also groups the, uh, the species. So this graphic, um, the verticals are basically species groupings into uh, sort of similar um, uh, similar um, structures, and then uh, the, the rows represent the individual species, and so you can see, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the green to red to, to black are basically the abundance levels of the various species, and you can see um, some really interesting structures if, if, you, if you sort of subdivide this. Uh, so, for example, you can see a, a group of species that are relatively shallow water that are characterized by um, this uh, station grouping AN, which is the um, the um, red circles. Um, you can see a, a deep water complex um, that's in in particular um, uh, in these regions here, uh, in particular the the gray triangles. And then you see this um, shallow water uh, tropical assemblage um, uh, demarked by square uh, red square AP. So um, in terms of the next graphic, just um, sort of keep a mental image of the red squares, the uh, green squares, sorry, and then um, the yellow crosses. And so when you actually plot these on a graphic, you can see that there are some interesting struct spatial structures in the data, but they're not um, unique. And that is you have a number of um, uh, consistent um, green squares uh, over on the West Florida Shelf, but they bleed over into the north central region of the Gulf. Uh, similarly, you see the yellow crosses, and they bleed over um, between the northwest and the southwest, et cetera. And then you see the, the red squares that bleed over between the Yucatan Peninsula and, the, and Cuba. So what we've got is a, a modular structure, but with a lot of interconnection at the edges, so that these aren't uh, necessarily discrete units uh, of species composition. So that's important in, in, in thinking about these issues. So. Uh, one way we can characterize this, uh, as I said before, is to look at the, the numbers of shared species. And so this graphic really takes um, all of the long line survey data and looks at um, the degree to which there, there are shared species between these six spatial modules. So for example, you see about 60 shared species between the West Florida Shelf and the North Central area. Conversely, you see um, only eight uh, shared species between Cuba and the Northwest. Uh, with varying degrees of connectivity depending on, on the subgroups. Uh, relatively high connectivity between the West Florida Shelf and Yucatan, and modest uh, connectivity between the Southwest, et cetera. Um, so, um, as we said before, species association is certainly a necessary, but they're not a sufficient condition for evaluating the strength of the mechanisms of connectivity. And so, we need to um, look at it in a little bit more detail, and that is, um, how fish may actually be connected in terms of um, uh, not only do they share a similar um, habitats, but also um, uh, is there any long-term degree of connectivity between the areas? And this would occur basically in adult fishes by, by actual uh, physical movement uh, or um, through the hydrodynamic processes, um, particularly for bony fishes in the distribution of fish eggs and larvae. Uh, recall that uh, a substantial fraction of the animals uh, in that long line survey were elasmobranchs, and of course they would not have any movement potential from eggs and larvae as, as the um, animals are um, uh, oval viviparous. So uh, one of the things that we can look at in terms of the potential distribution of adult fishes is 
um, what are the potential scales of connectivity relative to how far they can swim? So uh, one of the things that we did with the data are is to um, um, bend them into um, into these um, uh, uh, centroids. Uh, so each um, uh, dark uh, circle is the um, the weighted uh, latitude and longitude within the spatial structure. So for example, here's the West Florida Shelf and, and the North Central region, and the, the distance between the centroids is 426 kilometers. The largest distance here is about 1,600 kilometers between um, the southwestern Gulf of Mexico and, and the Shelf. But remember, if um, we've got demersal fish swimming, they're not going to swim across the long axis of the Gulf. They're going to swim this way and so that's around 2,000 uh, uh, kilometers. So, so how does the um, movement potential of the adults relate to these minimum um, spanning uh, lattices of, of the centroids? So one of the things that we did was um, a, a uh, meta-analysis of uh, about 30 tagging studies that have been done with various species that are located in the Gulf. And so here, what you see in this graphic is um, the mean displacement from the tagging survey versus the maximum um, that the survey indicated. So, for example, you can see some really interesting structures of species. In this case, um, sailfish, mako shark, white marlin, dusky shark. These are animals that are quite peripatetic in the region, and certainly they could span all of the um, areas in the Gulf. Um, what, what we've overplotted here is the uh, the minimum distance uh, and maximum distance between the centroids. So, so this is the minimum distance between North Central and West Florida Shelf, and this is the minimum distance between um, the West Florida Shelf and, and the Southwest. Um, the, the interesting group of species, and, and why this is important, uh, are these uh, inside the 426 box. These are um, species like red snapper, RS, gag grouper, gag, uh, red grouper, red hind, um, and a number of shark species here. Um, you can see that most of these species have mean displacements on the order of tens of kilometers, and the maximum displacements may be on the order of um, two or three hundred. So clearly, adult fish movement is not going to be a major component, particularly of a, a more instantaneous uh, recovery potential if one of these modules is, is heavily impacted. Um, certainly, these animals could eventually go there, but it's, it's going to be a, a long process. And, the extreme, of course, is, is uh, golden tilefish, where there was a tagging study done, and basically they did not move at all. So the only uh, potential for them to redistribute around the system is through uh, movement of eggs and larvae. And so um, what we did as a second part of this is uh, um, to use the uh, connectivity modeling system that Claire Paris has developed to try to look at the potential uh, movement um, of eggs and larvae around the system and how that might uh, interrelate. And so in this uh, particular modeling system, there's a, an ecological or a larval fish module and then a hydrodynamic module um, and uh, Lagrangian stochastic uh, model and then basically a commercial habitat model that allows the animals to settle. So, um, so what we use is the, the long line data to seed this model to look at patterns of, of larval dispersal based on where the animals might in fact be um, spawned. So um, for the purposes of illustration, we use four different species. Um, a tuna species, um, um, here you can see the larval duration for um, tip typically exhibited by these species, the habitat um, uh, provinces that they occur in based on the long line survey, their spawning season, and the degree of vertical migration that the larvae may undertake. And you can see there's a fairly extreme difference between um, tuna and red snapper and golden tilefish, which have a 100-day um, larval duration. So you can, you can tell um, straight up you know, what the potential for distribution around this network might be. So this is kind of a money shot here in terms of um, three of the species that we've got, uh, red snapper, red grouper, and tilefish. These are the distributions from the long line survey. So you can see that all three were distributed you know, fairly significantly around the Gulf. Red grouper primarily in the West Florida Shelf and in, in the Yucatan. Uh, um, uh, obviously, um, tilefish uh, distributed all the way around the Gulf. These are the locations where the seeding of the uh, hydrodynamic models occurred. And so in each one of those, um, those um, dots, basically, um, uh, they were seeded with the larvae every six days during the spawning period. And then this is where the larvae actually ended up. And so you can see 
for example, the, the larvae of red snapper are pretty generally distributed around the Gulf, not so much the red grouper. And then, uh, then again, you can see the larvae of the um, tilefish are well distributed around the system. So one of the ways we can actually look at the, the degree of connectivity are, are three different metrics. So um, for the sake of example, um, you can see these connections that are drawn between the centroids of the various areas. So these are called edges, and so the, they are read in a, in a uh, clockwise manner. So, so um, in terms of the northwest uh, connectivity to the southwest, um, this, the, the uh, larvae that would potentially be evicted to the southwest are given by this line, and the larvae from the southwest to the northwest are, are given by these lines. The other two metrics here are the what we call the between between a centrality, which is a metric many people use in network analyses, and that's uh, given by the the sizes of the relative circles. So, for example, in red snapper, the circles are relatively large. In gold and tilefish, the circles are relatively small. So, the amount of centrality that you have with a hundred-day larvae distribution is a lot different than some of the others. And then the other metric is the, the proportion of self-recruitment. So for example, in Red Grouper, you've got quite a bit of self-recruitment uh, in the West Florida Shelf area, but very little in, in some of the other areas. And so you can see some extreme values where um, the golden tilefish have relatively high uh, edge connectivity um, throughout the Gulf, and that's primarily because of their larval lifespan. Um, and, but very little uh, between the centrality in terms of um, the importance of, of a particular area as kind of a way station between between uh, regions. And so, just as a um, as a um, a bottom line here, the Southwest Province seems to be a central node in con connecting both the uh, the Yucatan and the Northwest together. In fact, it's probably the the most central node of all other areas in the region, implying that. If there was a large oil spill, um, like for example, Ixtoc, uh in 1979, this might be a particularly vulnerable area. And as well on the other side of the Gulf of Mexico, the West Florida Shelf is probably a particularly vulnerable uh, area as well. So just in summary, um, the larval transfer, transport, as we infer from the connectivity modeling system, is a primary control of connectivity between these oce oceanic provinces. And the fish community structure is primarily shaped by the variation in the connections with the other provinces in terms of larval, larval transport. Um, and the, the, the important species in the Gulf have very different dispersal potentials and connectivity networks. Uh, and certainly, um, they're, they're important in trying to understand uh, both perturbations and the conservation actions for recovery. Um, so the last little bit I want to introduce is the, the connectivity in the vertical. And, and Tracy will certainly talk about this at, in detail, but one of the aspects that I'm particularly interested in is, uh, is the large pelagic predators and how they may be uh, interacting with the, uh, the vertically migrating mesopelagic species. And so here's an here's a, a echogram of, of this deal vertical migration, which is extreme in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, you can see that the animals are trying to take advantage of high chlorophyll uh, in, the, in the upper um, ocean. Um, and in particular, um, the night feeding mesopelagic species are trying to trying to un uh, utilize that productivity, and that there are multiple scales of these deal vertical migrations that occur in the Gulf. Um, in particular, um, we had done a, a, with Gomery's help a, a long line survey both uh, in the uh, epipelagic water. So during the daytime, you can see that there are a variety of predators like wahoo and um, lancet fish and yellowfin tuna. Uh, during the day, uh, swordfish, escalars, and other species are down deep. But at night, you can see that there's a different community. And so, so this is really important in trying to understand um, uh, how um, oil spills may be important in impacting not only the, the prey, but the predators as well. Um, by looking at the uh, food habits of these predators, we can assess something about the uh, vertical migra migratory habits, and in this case, um, this is a, a, the diet from a lancet fish, and you can see uh, a number of epipelagic prey, uh, this animal is taken during the day, but also a number of um, mesopelagic prey, uh, non-migrating species um, like these um, hatchet fish. And so this implies that these animals may actually be undergoing a uh, reverse deal migration, that is they're feeding down deep um, during the evening and feeding during the day on the epis. Uh, 
And so um, there, there's a complex set, set of, of uh, migrations that are important to uh, include in this, and in particular, how um, plumes may uh, plumes of oil that may be buried in the deep because of deep blowouts would would necessarily um, allow these animals um, to you know uh, be contaminated in the deep, but then um, come up to the surface where they interact with other species. So um, that being said, uh, um, with that, um, certainly want to um, uh, take the opportunity to point out two other workshops that we have ongoing that we're going to take a, a, a look at this both in July and then later on in October. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to you, Ken. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, next up, we have Dr. Tracy Sutton. We'll talk about pelagic ecosystem dynamics in a highly impacted water column, the Gulf of Mexico after Deepwater Horizon. Okay, yeah, uh, can you hear me, Kim? Yes, go ahead. Excellent, Thanks. all right, okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna continue on uh, with uh, what Steve was talking about and add some more bits uh, and segue to Jim's talk as well. So, um, again, we're talking about the pelagic fauna, um, generally offshore, the 1,000-meter isobath, but we're, we're actually looking around the, the, the rim now as well because that's quite important. But we're looking at the fauna from zero to 1,500 meters. So what I'm going to try to do is focus on some things that would be uh, most relevant for modeling efforts. So uh, looking first at the, uh, at the effect on the lower end. So again, we're talking about more or less the intermediate trophic levels, fishes, shrimp, squids, uh, and in many cases, gelatinous zooplankton functioning as predators. So there, there is some information available from empirical studies about the importance of this fauna on the, the low end production, particularly zooplankton production. Uh, Tom Hopkins, in, in a lot of his seminal work in the Eastern Gulf, found that um, lantern fishes in particular were this very important component of the total carbon flux of the oceanic gulf. And when we looked at the total contribution of, of fishes and pelagic shrimp, these mesopelagic shrimps, they're moving, uh, we estimated, around a quarter of daily zooplankton production, which is, which is really quite high. Uh, you would expect that in a oligotrophic system. But it actually is probably higher than that because since this work uh, has come out, there's, there's been a couple of work showing that if you want to get a true estimate of the abundance of this deep pelagic fauna, um, you really have to upscale your net uh, estimate. So uh, there was a paper that came out about fishes, and then one paper that came out about a month uh, month, month ago, I guess, um, where we also upscaled the shrimp biomass. So what this means is that this deep pelagic fauna is consuming the majority of zooplankton production in the Gulf of Mexico. And then this really follows on with some modeling work of Gil Rowe, who found that um, really the a particular organic carbon is not making the seafloor. It's really getting consumed in the water column by the, by the fauna. So, so that was the, you know, that we, we see a, a, what looks like a very tight linkage between the, you know, intermediate trophic levels and the base of the food chain out there. But also they're important as, as prey or, or or prey of prey, I say, I'll, I'll explain that. So Steve already mentioned the importance to uh, quite a few um, large vertebrates offshore, the large uh, apex predators that feed primarily on this deep living prey. Some of the ones you might be more surprised about, uh, white sharks, for example, are, are really kind of more of a deep pelagic fish that actually comes in shore to feed uh, periodically. So they spend a lot of time deep. And uh, then we also found out not too long ago that juvenile bluefin tuna, which of course are extremely important in the Gulf of Mexico, um, overwinter below a thousand meters. So it, it does show that there's a lot of linkage between the apex predator, especially fishes, with the importance that um, gomery groups have placed on marine mammals. And as Monica mentioned, that's a kind of a focus interest for Sea Grant. Uh, just looking at the at the mammals in the Gulf, we find again very very tight linkages. So lantern fishes, in particular, are the primary prey of Gulf stenella dolphins, uh, 
Um, and then as, as you get kind of bigger amongst the fauna, you see the importance of other, other taxa. And then it, again, as things get bigger, squids start to be more and more important. And these are all mesopelagic, bathypelagic squids primarily. And then once you get to the biggest ones, the really meso and bathypelagic squids become extremely important. So, uh, so we need to understand the, the prey field dynamics. So uh, here's my unreadable graphic requirement. This is basically deep end in a nutshell. What I'm going to do is go through this and point out the parts that are most relevant for, the, for modeling efforts. Um, so, so the two main components, the effect on the biota and the effect on processes. Uh, Steve has already covered a bit of that, and Jim's going to cover the right-hand side of this slide. So I'm going to talk more about what we – would have to offer modeling efforts. And these are primary, primarily in the arena of what's out there, how much, and, and where is it distributed. So our, our field sampling for deep end, just to show the vertical aspect. So this discrete depth information is quite important for understanding uh, carbon dynamics, uh, really as a function of time of day as much as where you are in the Gulf. So we had a fairly large scale discrete depth sampling program. Um, of course, depth is not the only uh, spatial variable out there. So during deep end cruises, we did try to organize our sampling to uh, account for uh, what we thought would be important environmental drivers. So for example, uh, distribution of chlorophyll and riverine output, we, we steered cruises to sample from very oligotrophic waters up to almost mesotrophic and back out again. And then um, getting these large scale mesoscale features uh, like, like eddies uh, is quite important. So our sampling patterns also tried to encompass the variability of eddies. Because again, the, one of the main goals of Deep End was trying to find out what's natural variability out there and do we see anything that we would consider to be unnatural variability? Uh, one thing I want to uh, inform the group about, um, most of what we you know, present, a lot of us, is about this uh, large deep living stuff, but we also had a, an ichthyoplankton component in deep end. Uh, we have five cruises. These are the transex lines. So uh, for those of you interested in the early life history stages of fishes, uh, I would encourage you to contact uh, uh, Jay Rooker at, at Texas a and Galveston. Okay, and then we had a pre-deep end component. So uh, these PIs that are listed below that are all part of deep end uh, were also involved in the NERDA. So this was actually the first of our sampling out there. So this was a, a project I led to try to give NOAA some information about uh, the fauna that's out there. Because remember, we really had nothing before Deepwater Horizon. So we had a pretty good sized grid of the Northern Gulf with a lot of uh, spatial and temporal coverage and, and a very robust sample size. So that's really the, the point of all that. So the, as far as the what's out there, one of the really the key uh, metrics of, of community health and, and resiliency is biodiversity. So that was an important thing for us to look at. A uh, fairly important thing to take into mind is, a, is again, a, a modeling uh, effort of the Gulf, working in the, the importance of biodiversity is something we really need to consider. And we find that, um, you guys have may have seen this before. the The deep Gulf is particularly uh, speciose. So we've we found about twelve hundred species to date, looking at fishes, shrimps, squids, and, and jellies. Um, and that number is still increasing. We haven't quite maxed out, and and doesn't look like we're going to real soon anyway. Uh, and one of the reasons, of course, is the Gulf is is really unique in the world ocean in terms of its place, um, its characteristics. So it's one of these super diverse, it's really more of an ecotome of, of tropical meets, um, almost temperate um, because of the characteristics of the Gulf, well oxygenated at depth. And it, it also may be a, have been a refugium during mass extinctions over the course of, of the pelagic environment. You know, the Gulf is, is pretty old. 
So, um, so we have a funnel inventory that's, that's not complete. We still need to do some work, but um, it's a lot better than it was before. And it's certainly one of the best known places in the world ocean now. Um, the quantitative distribution data are probably of most interest for, for modeling. Um, so we have that on a couple of scales. So um, as Steve mentioned, this, this dial vertical migration, which you can see when you look at these long acoustical transects over space and time, that really is the key distributional feature of the open gulf. The, we see biotic changes on the meter scale vertically, whereas that same level of change would be on the tens to hundreds of, of kilometers in the horizontal scale. So that vertical scale is really quite important. Um, from our net sampling, uh, we have a, a fairly resolved uh, view of the bulk movement up and down during day and night. So this is the distribution of carbon, and I, I put this in there because we've converted all of our numbers and, and taxon specific information into carbon. So we have a, a common unit of currency across a number of working groups. Uh, so here's a plot of the distribution of fish carbon day and night. So what you see here is one of the most striking features, this large assemblage during the day that, that swims up at night into the epipelagic. So that's what Steve described perfectly. So I don't need to really go on any more about that. The, the distribution, the flux of active carbon there is, is really the key feature in the Gulf. What we also saw is um, dial migration by the bathypelagic fauna. So the things that live below a thousand meters do migrate up at night and then migrate back down. The implication here is that when we have these deep spills that have deep plumes, there is an active migration of organisms that can carry that up well above the plume, making it um, bioavailable and any contamination with it, again, to higher trophic levels. So, um, one thing that we've we've really focused on is the distributional dynamics of various uh, levels through the food chain, really starting with say gelatinous zooplankton and larval fishes, all the way up to some of the largest stuff that we catch, like like the lancet fish that Steve showed. And what we find is that um, it's really this this uh, you know coordination of space, time, and depth that really seems to be an important driver across a wide range of trophic levels. So in terms of spatially explicit modeling, um, having this Lagrangian perspective really, really is key offshore. The geographic perspective, it, not, not as much. Um, but again, we're looking near the shelf break now. now. There's quite a bit of dispersion you can get offshore just by swimming up and down. So, uh, you know, a number of studies, uh, particularly Gomery studies, have shown that the, the deep Lagrangian geography of the Gulf is different than what you see near the surface. So uh, an upwards movement of a hundreds of meters can move you around in the Gulf kilometers on a daily scale and also in and out of the Gulf on a yearly scale. So really important things to consider there, I think. Okay, and then um, this, this kind of segues to habitat characterization. You, we often have been stumbling over that problem of what is pelagic habitat? How would you describe that? So uh, one of our goals was to come up with a method of characterizing pelagic habitat. This paper actually just came out on Friday, so it, it's now available and in press. And it's a um, empirically um, ground truth um, pelagic uh, characterization characterization scheme based on HICOM data that includes depth as a feature. So now we have a way of, of parsing out uh, the various important blocks of what we would call pelagic habitat and also how they vary through time. So in terms of time, um, we, we do have now we've built up a, a multi-annual database so we can look at some of the the longer term consequences of Deepwater Horizon. Um, and again, the, the important point for us here is that we really do have to pay attention to both space and time simultaneously, 
because the comparing time really also is a function of of where you are at that time. So and that, this is not new to anybody. It's just a, a thing to, to stress while we're talking to a larger group. Um, so taking this, uh, what we call this natural envelope of variability um, into, into, into consideration and then controlling for variability for things like mesoscale features and whatnot, our, our, our temporal pattern here is that we've seen a, really a massive decline, um, not just pelagic fishes, but also uh, shrimps and squids as well. But our, I'm presenting the data on fishes because that's what I'm most uh, familiar with. So uh, what you see here is uh, the red bars are the abundance of pelagic fishes the year after Deepwater Horizon, uh, this, this offshore nectin sampling analysis program onset. And then what you see in blue here are the same data taken with the same gear, the same places, the same depth strategy, everything um, during deep ends, so 2015 through 17. So the, the decline in life offshore has been dramatic and persistent. And, and if we look at one particular group, those lantern fishes that were so important in terms of taking zooplankton and also so important in terms of being prey for tunas and stenella dolphins, uh, we see that their, their numbers have declined uh, 75 to 84% since 2011. So, uh, and this is across all depth bends in which they occur. So that's what you're looking at from left to right. So it's a pretty dramatic effect. Um, we had no baseline data before Deepwater Horizon. So we, you know, at this point, we're not saying this was because of Deepwater Horizon because hypothetically 2011 could have been a fantastic year. So what we're looking at now is, is the genetic uh, status of things out there to see if we see genetic evidence of a recent population crash because that shows up in genetic diversity. Um, one thing we have found, and that is there is still a signal of, of deep water horizon out there now, and you see that in um, uh, PAH, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon composition in fishes. So if you look at this graph, the, the black bars are the tissue loads. So we actually had pre-deep water horizon data. So we see low tissue loads relatively of PEHs, and then we see this really massive spike during deep water horizon and the year after. And then during deep end, the tissue loads have gone back down towards the, the pre-spill, but they're still higher than the pre-spill. The thing is, if you look at the ovaries of fishes, uh, that super lipid rich uh, component, so we took the ovaries out, ran those analyses, those values are still above sublethal um, even now or as of to late 2017. We're analyzing 2018 now. So there's still an effect out there which hypothetically could have contributed to loss of year classes. All right, uh, food web, uh, again, Jim's gonna handle that. Steve's already touched on it. All I will say about that is that our mixing model analyses have, have suggested that even the predators that live very deep are utilizing carbon from near the surface. Uh, indicating that a, a, a spill, a future spill, doesn't have to be deep to affect the deep water fauna. Um, if it's large and surface, a ship strike or something like that, it can still affect the food chain all the way down to great depth. Um, okay, so summarizing, what we have are uh, taxonomically resolved, spatially resolved, uh, distributional data for those mid-levels of mid-trophic levels of the Gulf, both in terms of abundance and, and carbon. Uh, we have a method for characterizing pelagic habitat, so we can say the sample came from this type of habitat, the major habitat, so that we can compare oranges to oranges. Uh, we still find evidence that uh, deep water horizon is still ongoing. There are mechanisms out there that are keeping it um, active, if you will, um, even now. So, so we, we really do want to try to continue uh, 
our sampling after uh, Gomri. Um, and I'm going to end that right there and, and pass the mic to, to Jim. Hello. Oh, let me. This is Jim. Hi. I'm going to uh, try to find my talk here. And can you can you guys see that? Yeah, looks good, Jim. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I'm talking about a, a a vertically resolved uh, food web model uh, for the oceanic. Uh, North Central section of the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and this is a pro this is a, a two year uh, Gomri project uh, that Frank Hernandez is leading. Um, I'm doing the big end to end modeling, uh, while Kelly and uh, Stace, uh, Kelly and uh, Stacy Calhoun are are actually doing the assembling of the food web uh, portion. Uh, so our, our main questions are, how are the epipelagic, mesopelagic, bathypelagic, and benthic zones trophically connected within the oceanic Gulf of Mexico? And then how do the perturbations and stressors uh, to any one of these depth zones uh, propagate between all zones in the water column? So our methods are uh, to infer trophic relations within uh, distinct depth zones from survey data and diet data and stable isotope data. Uh, using this to assemble a, a mass balanced food web model using common, the most common food web modeling technique uh, globally now is uh, Ecopath. But we're expanding upon that. We're, we're going to quantify the connectivity between these depth zones as driven by a vertical migration, particle sinking and physical mixing using a uh, Ecotran uh, end to end uh, modeling platform that also uh, has uh, uh, physical drivers in the system. And then we're going to take this and investigate the consequences of perturbations uh, to the food web structures and to vertical exchange uh, processes. So uh, this is a two-year project. Uh, right now we're assembling the food, assembling the food web. Uh, this is just an example of our, our uh, working uh, trophic structure. Uh, so the food web itself has uh, tentatively has 58 living groups. Most of the groups that we're going to be uh, defining here from new data are uh, lower trophic zooplankton and uh, mesopelagic and bathypelagic uh, fish groups. Uh, other other uh, functional groups in the system uh, are coming from uh, CMAP, CMAP database of, of, of the Gulf. Uh, Higher trophic level groups were deriving from information from, from the literature, as well as uh, the primary productivity, which is coming from uh, the satellite data. Uh, on the right-hand side of the graph, these are uh, mostly, uh, uh, except for the eggs, uh, non-living uh, members of the, of the food web that were including in it as a uh, end-to-end -end model. So we're, uh, considering uh, changes in the nitrate nutrient pools. And we're ha having at least uh, three detritus pools. Eventually, I think we're going to have considerably more of that. Uh, those are going to be defined by, um, mostly by sink sinking rate classes. And so our key data sources uh, for this are uh, the NRDA cruises and the deep end cruises. And from that, we're getting uh, zooplankton, ichthyoplankton, and micro-necton biomasses, uh, community uh, composition, uh, vertical distribution, and migration data, uh, like as Tracy showed. Uh, we're also extracting uh, uh, in Frank's lab and, uh, and Kevin Dillon's lab uh, diet and stable isotope data from, uh, from, from these groups. And this is an example uh, in, in Kelly's lab. Uh, she's got a, a, a rapid automated system that she is using to uh, classify uh, taxonomic groups and abundances in uh, zo zooplankton community. And uh, for each, each functional group, uh, we're classifying groups by the depth zones and migration patterns, uh, taking into account differences in the feeding intensity and diet differences in the depth zones, 
and the migration patterns in the depth zones. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, mesopelagic fishes, we are dividing among, we're, we're classifying these both by diet structure and also by uh, migration patterns. And, and we're just breaking those into, right now, uh, non-migrating, strongly migrating, and uh, weak, weak migrating fishes. All right, uh, so, but what I'm doing is I, I'm, I'm doing the uh, model structure portion of, of, the, of the project. So I just want to give you a little background on, on what we're doing here. Uh, so we're using a model platform that's called Ecotran. Its goal is to occupy the, the, the space in complexity between the more general snapshot food web model that, that's used called Ecopath and the high-end uh, complex model systems called uh, such as such as Atlantis. So this is a model system that John Steele of, of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute uh, devised and that I worked on with him. Um, so the, he breaks down the advantages of Ecopath and the disadvantages. So Ecopath is, it prioritizes the data strengths. It's built up upon fish and fisheries data. It's based upon diet data. Uh, all the models are a single form, format, so they're, ge they're generally applicable from ecosystem to ecosystem to ecosystem, making comparisons fairly e easy. And they're also uh, plug-and-play pl plug models. Uh, they, they take a common set of data, uh, and it's, it's, it takes a long time, but uh, conceptually it's easy to build a, a food web model within the Ecopath system. But the disadvantages are, that Ecopath uh, calculates a food web model as a top-down solution based upon the demand of a predator on subsequent, subsequent, subsequently lower uh, trophic levels. They generally don't include microbial food webs, and they generally do not include uh, a mechanistic physical model within the system. So. Uh, the Ecotran model is it's actually quite simple. It, it takes the solution of a food web, a mass balanced food web uh, that can be derived from uh, an Ecopath model and converts it to a, a map of the flow of the production of every group in the system to each of its consumers or also uh, where the fate of all metabolites and all detritus uh, to, to, to create to create a a map a full map of the food web that includes both biotic and non-biotic uh, uh, biomass pools and in this system it has the advantage that it's uh, uh, we can run very rapid Monte Carlo analyses to account for the propagation of air in both uh, trophic relationships and within uh, physiological uh, rates for each each functional group. So, some quick metrics that we can pull out of an Ecotran model uh, right off the bat after it gets built up is we can uh, co characterize each functional group in terms of its importance as an energy transfer node. In this, we are uh, we look at the importance of a group as a consumer based upon its footprint, its energy demand upon uh, lower, all the lower trophic groups in the ecosystem. And conversely, we can look at its importance as a producer in terms of the amount of production that it passes up the food web to higher functional groups. And so just as a quick example, this, this is actually the Northern California current where I, I did this analysis where I compared the footprints and reaches for some key functional groups, euphausids, uh, sardine, and jellyfish. And just in brief, you can compare uh, the, the upper graphs show the footprints in the green showing the relative importance of, of krill on the left and the much higher importance of uh, 
jellyfish on the right in terms of energy demand on the system, where you look at the, the red graphs at the very top, you can see the relative proportion of energy that they, they pass, pass up the food web. So in this case, you see that krill on the left pass a large proportion of what they take out of the food web, what they take from uh, lower trophic levels and pass it to higher trophic levels, whereas the jellyfish consume a lot of energy from the system, but pass very little of that up to higher trophic levels. And it's also uh, quite easy to run uh, structural scenarios on a snapshot food web. In this case, we're simulating the effect of high jellyfish abundance within the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, so if, if we force jellyfish high, uh, some key, Important commercial groups like Gulf Menhaden are, are, are depressed, uh, where other, other groups that prey directly upon uh, jellyfish uh, gain fr from the greater food supply. But in general, most groups in the system are depressed. In fact, uh, this, this effect uh, can be quite high on, uh, on, on uh, piscivores and piscivores. Uh, Pisivores and, and seabirds. But in this current modeling effort that we're doing, uh, we are not doing snapshot analyses. We are running the system in a, in a time dynamic sense. So this is an example of a time dynamic model that was run for the, in Ecotran for the Northern California Current. Uh, we can run similar, we're going to do this in a similar fashion for uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so we run it, run the whole model with a, a straight uh, physical driver. It has an integrated uh, plankton production model in the system, and we can see the evolution of the system, and we can introduce uh, various perturbations into the system. Uh, so uh, in this case, the model has a general five box model structure uh, that we've uh, run across uh, several different uh, continental shelf ecosystems. But for the Gulf of Mexico, we're turning this on its side uh, to have a, 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 a four box uh, vertically, vertically stacked uh, food web model uh, defining the pelagic, mesopelagic, and bathypelagic, and, and benthic food webs. And each, each box is going to have an, has an individually uh, defined food web. And as physical fluxes, we're considering the importance of vertical migration of, of the living groups sinking particle sinking of, of various uh, uh, particle classes defined by sinking rates uh, consideration of uh, nutrient recycling via bacterial metabolism in each 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 depth zone and the vertical mixing of uh, of nutrients across uh, across domain boundaries so the metrics that we're going to be deriving from the model are the ranking of the functional group's importance as energy transfer nodes using the footprint and reach metrics, uh, quantifying the energy fluxes between the depth zones. And uh, we are uh, right now, we're set up to use uh, nitrogen-based bio biomasses, but we can convert that to carbon-based biomasses. And we are ranking the process importance of uh, as drivers of ecosystem production within each depth zone by processes what we're doing is rating within each depth zone the importance of primary production, uh, particle sinking as a uh, as a food source to lower to uh, the deeper the depth zones, importance of vertical migration as a food supply and as extracting food from each depth zone, and vertical mixing of uh, of nutrients. And uh, for dynamic analyses, we're looking at the importance of uh, sensitivity of the system to a detritus recycling, uh, sensitivity to changes in seasonal and interannual uh, sinking particle flux rates, and sensitivity to changes in the deep water fish and micro necton community, especially as uh, affected by changes in, in the metabolic rates of the system. And uh, the graph down here at the bottom just shows an example of the importance how. Uh, importance of detritus recycling ha has upon different ecosystems. So this is an example of the Northern California current on the left and the 
North Sea on the right, uh, using different assumptions of the rates of demersal recycling upon the uh, time scale it takes the, each system to find a new equilibrium following a, a perturbation, a, a large per scale perturbation into uh, of a large scale perturbation. In this case, we, we, uh, uh, we did a, uh, an increase in uh, nu nutrient supply to drive the total productivity of the system. And the response that we're looking at is the response time of uh, piscivorous fishes. And so basically as the rate of demersal recycling, that is the amount of detritus that is recycled back into the living food web rather than being sequestered into the into the into the sediment as the amount of detritus that is recycled back into the living food web increases the response time following perturbations of the, each system uh, increases dramatically and that is also a highly dependent upon the physical context of the system. So in the upwelling system, that's quite open to, quite open to, the, quite open to the open ocean, uh, the, the, uh, the, the time scale of recycling uh, is only 10 years, whereas uh, in, in a semi-enclosed basin like the North Sea, uh, the, the, change in, of, uh, the change in the system uh, runs up to a, a quarter quarter century, and uh, finally, uh, in this system, just want to talk about the shortcuts we're taking in this two-year project. Our goal is to have a model that's available for people to use that can be expanded to to further to mo more in-depth, more detailed uh, investigations. So now we're using idealized seasonal physics, but the model is ready for driving via higher order physical models like Brahms models. Uh, we're considering a single oceanic subregion, but we are the model is capable of handling multiple geographic subregions. Uh, uh, it's ready to be coupled to a integrated lower trophic plankton production model, and more importantly, uh, right now we're using invariant for our investigations. Now we are in using invariant physiologies, but the model handles changing physiologies for all the living groups, which can include seasonal stressors as well as exposure to, uh, to pollutants. And uh, we can also conduct management strategy evaluations with this model system. And that's, that's, that's my talk. Thank you. Terrific, thanks a lot, Jim. Very interesting. Um, thank you to all of our speakers. We're a little bit over time, but anyone who is able to uh, remain online with us, uh, we will have a, a quick question period. Libby? Hi, Jim, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Great, so we had one question from um, Helena asking the speakers about the links to human health. Um, so sort of the fish, shellfish, consumer link. I see Steve has answered that question. Um, so I'll give Steve the opportunity to either uh, respond to the group or our other speakers a question, an opportunity to respond as well. And for those who are going to stay on the line, please type your questions into the chat box and we'll consolidate and put those to the speakers. All right, Campbell, I hear no, uh, no other takers on answering the human health linkage question, and I see no other questions in the chat box. Okay, um, I see there has been a few questions uh, bounced around privately, so um, if anyone uh, feels that their question hasn't been answered, uh, maybe just take a moment now to type it in. I will be, uh, I will remain here and uh, maybe if I could ask our speakers to remain online for just a few minutes.
until we're sure that uh, all the questions have been answered. Otherwise, I'd like to thank everyone for their participation in today's webinar and uh, remind you that on Thursday at 10 a.m., uh, there's a follow-up session. And if you're interested to uh, participate as a listener, then uh, send me your email either directly uh, or enter it into the chat window. Thank you very much, everyone.